they are okay. it has it looks like this has this kind of so that everybody kind of has their own it's, it's academia and then um it's more or less so the podium is first and then, and then the next two is going to be in the corner of the line. Yeah, I know, I know it. And this is the ramp spot. It's quite important for me. Because okay. you know that there's a uh, school, Avant? Yeah. The green one? Oak school, yeah. yeah. Oh, so. Then there is a uh, primary school. Okay. That's where my daughter is. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I live just uh, around here. I know where that is. Yeah, okay. Okay, well, let, let's uh, plunge in. Uh, we, we were talking uh, initially, to, uh, trying to, to, to identify uh, what is the, the, the problem is, if there is a problem. Um, and we, we started talking about the Muslim intellectual contribution to, in the modern age. Um, one of the aspects that you would think that there would be a greater uh, scholarly contribution by Muslim uh, uh, academics or scholars in trying to trace and, and analyze um, is the, the contribution of the Muslim civilization to um, what, uh, uh, the dominant ideas of uh, the world in which we live today. Um, you know, the the sort of uh, the case for we often talk about the Judeo-Christian tradition. Uh, I, I don't know if, uh, if you have, any, have you guys heard of a fellow called Richard Boulet. Well, Richard Boulet, I write his name um, for uh, your interest. Richard Bonetti, uh, professor uh, at um, Columbia uh, University, he is a serious scholar. Uh, <clears throat> and he wrote a, a book that um, did not have much impact, but that ought to have had considerable impact. Uh, and, and the book is called, is called The Case for a Muslim slash Judeo slash Christian uh, civilization. It, his, his argument is one which is not original, but he, he compiles quite a bit of evidence that clearly up to the that the, the Muslim contribution to the to the European Renaissance is is um, not just uh, substantial, but it is it, it is critical, um, and um, there are, uh, there are several um, well, I mean, several scholars who've made serious scholarly contribution on, on this theme, which is, for instance, um, there's a fellow from Israel, um, his name is um, Kohlberg. Oh, actually, better than Kohlberg. Uh, Kramer, his first name, I think, is Joel. Kramer. But you have to be careful because there's, there's, uh, there's two Kramers. Both of them are from Israel. One of them is an Islamophobe, and the other guy uh, wrote uh, a, a book, a very big book, <coughs> 1,500 pages, 
published by Brill called A Muslim Scholar at Work. A fascinating, fascinating book. He, he, he studied a medieval Muslim scholar and reconstructed the contents of the library of that Muslim scholar. What did this Muslim scholar have on his shelf? And, um, and uh, 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 like uh, Boulet and, and others, he, he, he argues that it is, it, while politically there, and especially in response to the uh, Ottoman invasions of Eastern Europe, uh, there was a, a considerable movement to sort of the, to, uh, to, to deny the Muslim roots of many ideas and institutions and so on, but that the Muslim civilizational contribution, in fact, is all prevailed. Similarly, if, have you ever read a, f a fellow um, called George Magdusi? Oh, yes. Yeah. And George Magdusi is, I consider him one of the most supportive scholars ever lived. Um, I'm going to write his, uh, now, George is, um, there are, George Magdusi, is the father, and he passed away, he was a, uh, he, when he passed away, he was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. His son is called John Magdusi, who's still alive, he's a law professor. And uh, George Moctesi wrote uh, a, a book uh, called uh, The Rise of Muslim uh, Colleges, um, uh, which is a very critical uh, book um, uh, in, in, in understanding the, the intellectual uh, uh, dynamics um, of the Muslim civilization. And then uh, he wrote uh, a book on the rise of humanism in the Islamic civilization, and he wrote a very significant book on um, uh, Ibn Aqil. Um, but one of the important uh, micro contributions um, is, um, for instance, tracing, this was done mostly by his son, by Jean Magdassi, not the father, the, the relation of the Inns of Court, which was a very, very influential institution in the development of British law, British common law. Uh, the Inns of Court is, 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 is sort of the, the, the major institutional uh, paradigm um, for the, 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 the dynamics of uh, the common, uh, early common law, and, and he traced Traced it as a as a as a verbatim borrow from um, a, the madrasas of, of medieval um, Sharia schools, but the, 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 so going back to this notion of the, the, the discussion about intellectual contributions and so on, you would think that. One area of scholarly contribution that would you would find a, a clear Muslim presence was, is to actually try to see how the, 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 the Muslim historical experience has impacted the modern world. But good luck, uh, you will find very little written uh, that is actually authored, uh, that was written in, in in, in, in Arabic or Persian or Turkish or, or um, uh, I am told uh, as well as Malaysian or Indonesian um, that uh, this is just another impoverished uh, field of scholarship. The, the, significant, the significance of this is in assisting us in, in, when we talk about 
the notion of Islamic particularity, what is, what is supposedly, symbolically, represents Islamic, let's say, a genuine Islamic institution or a genuine Islamic idea. How can you, methodologically, how can you even start discussing such a concept if you do not first settle the a priori question of transplantations and transmissions of traditions. In other words, what formed, what influences came, uh, were exercised upon the Islamic intellectual milieu and how did the Islamic intellectual in, in milieu itself influence other environments, particularly something as critical as the European Renaissance. This, if, if we are, if we take, just assume, instead of, of, of needing to prove it, but just assume that the, this thesis is correct, that in fact, uh, the Islamic civilization influenced in very critical ways the development of the European Renaissance, and that, uh, I mean, uh, I can't resist giving you one very, very clear example. Um, um, any fairly educated uh, Westerner would uh, know, even if they don't know any details, but would, would have a notion of Maimonides as a major influence on uh, the Western intellectual heritage, right? But uh, Maimonides, uh, his whole theological and jurisprudential discourse is unremarkable if placed in its Muslim context. In other words, if, if compared to his Muslim context, uh, Maimonides appears uh, very um, average. Uh, there are theologians and philosophers that have, and, and Maimonides himself, there's an article that was published in Studia Islamica, unfortunately I don't remember the name of the scholar, he's an he's a Israeli scholar, uh, about the, uh, who influenced Maimonides. And the scholar shows that Maimonides to have copied from a particular Shafi scholar in Egypt, many of his jurisprudential and theological ideas. But yet, we, we normally think of Maimonides as a major contributor to the Western civilization, but we do not think of a parallel to Maimonides as a major contribution to the Western civilization. The point is, if, if we just assume for the sake of argument that the, the critical uh, impact of the Islamic civilization upon the European Renaissance. This makes the question even of, well, what, um, what, how can we start dissecting or studying the nature of contemporary dynamics? If, in fact, as a matter of genealogy and lineage, the, the, Islam, the Islamic theological ideas, Islamic philosophical ideas, Islamic jurisprudential ideas, ha had a nexus and a, a deep involvement and interconnectedness with the, the European neighbors, particularly, uh, um, you know, through uh, the venues that we all know, Sicily, Spain, um, uh, even the Crusaders, and so on. Then, how does 
how, how, what are the dynamics that define Islamicity in the modern age? How do we, at a very, at, at a very innate level, how does one say, yes, the, 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 this is a part of Islam, or no, this is not a part of Islam? And this is uh, for Muslim intellectuals. I think it is it is far it is it is a, a, a quite a critical question. Uh, I mean, take for instance. Um, uh, uh, if, if um, as I often say in my writings, I've done, I, I, I've, I do this with students quite often, is that I will bring a text and have them read the text in English and uh, not tell them, uh, lie, basically lie to them, but tell them that this is written by, you know, Thomas Aquinas, or this was written by Augustine, or this was written by Abelard, or this was written by... And, uh, of course, they, they read it and they start responding to it as something that is fundamentally inconsistent with Islam. But, of course, the trick, as you probably guessed, is that actually the text would belong to Ghazali or belong to Ibn Taymiyyah or belong to Ibn Aqil or belong to Ibn Tufayl or, you know, it, it's a, 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 a what the, 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 the contradiction here is, is supposed to bring to the fore in the, in the minds of the students how do we identify Islamicity in the modern age? What, what, what defines Islamic identity? Now, you proposed the place of Salafia as a dominant paradigm, and, and I think th this really needs to, th something that we need to, to investigate. Um, in essence, what is Salafia? What is the idea of Salafia? The return to the, the, the purity of the earliest uh, sources for Islam. And what, what the, there's a buzzword or a buzz phrase for that. Do you, do you know what? It, in the Salaf al Salih, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, this is a, a, a very important buzz phrase that is used. <coughs> and I'm going to write it because of its significance. Al Salaf, Al Salih, the righteous predecessors or the um, righteous predecessors is the best way to to to, the, to uh, translate it. And the right tri righteous predecessors usually we refer to the companion. I mean, to uh, the prophet and the companions, and some mm, idea of a golden age of Islam in which true Islam was manifested. Now, we, one I think one obvious question is was the idea of a son of a son was it a utopian idea in the sense that it is supposed to represent the full fully realized potential of Islamicity. In other words, that here is a time where Islam was perfectly manifested. This is, a, you know, sort of the, the 
perfect realization of Islam. And if this is the, 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 the critical notion behind the idea of a son of a Saleh, how old do you think this idea is? Well, that's the question, isn't it? Yeah. But if, if, it's, if it's an original idea, that kind of undermines it. I mean, kind of. We, I mean, we know from texts, right, that Muslims have always referred to the, 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 the prophet and to the companions as exemplars. Right, we can all agree on that. I, I, there is no period, as a matter of of just simply a, a, a study of texts, and in which you would not find references to the prophet and to uh, the companion. But yet, we also know that these references to the prophet and to the companions as a historical reality that there is a great deal of diversity of opinion in especially in the various centuries of Islam. So the, the, if the idea of the son of Salah, the rightful predecessors, Let's say that it was born with Islam, that, that, that from the very beginning, Muslims recognized that the Prophet and the companions are an example to follow, right? Yet, this historical reality exists with another historical reality, and that is a, a, a remarkable diversity of opinions on theological matters and on legal matters. How many of you have ever uh, uh, see, uh, tried to read um, a book like Maqalat al-Islamiyyin? Mm -hmm. Maqalat al-Islamiyyin is a, 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 it's a, a book in a genre. Uh, the genre uh, is, um, uh, today we call it the genre of sect sectarianism but it's, it's a, that's a poor translation. And, 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 and like uh, uh, books on Milan and Nihal, um, I literally, Milan and Nihal translated as ideas and orientations. Maqalat uh, al-Islamiyin literally translated as the positions of Islamiyin Muslim, we, we can translate as Muslim uh, schools of thought, um, or books on ikhtilaf. What, what, what is, does ikhtilaf mean? Contradiction. On, um, sorry again? Contradiction. Not contradiction, but disagreement. Yeah, disagreement. Okay, uh, even diversity. Even if you, if you look at these texts that we, we the earliest example of such a text we have it comes from the third century, early third century Islamic. And the latest that we have, uh, I mean, the, those that I know of, and remember, we, we, there's a lot about our manuscripts that we don't know, uh, that I am aware of, it comes from the 10th century Islamic. And one of the things that strikes you is that they document a great deal of diversity of opinions about all types of questions in theology and law. Now, there is a contemporary uh, um, uh, attitude, particularly among uh, the puritanical orientations of saying, well, these books are really nothing more than 
a documentations of the heresies of Islam uh, that existed in Islam. So, in other words, a modern Puritan, if you if you ask them, well, what do you think of Maqalat al-Islamiyyin? What do you think of Al-Mirr al-Nihal of Shahrastani? Or Maqalat al-Islamiyyin by Al-Ash'ari? Or what do you think of Ibn Hazm's Al-Mirr al-Nihal? Or what do you think of Ikhtilaf uh, al-Mazahib? And the, 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 the Puritan will tell you, well, uh, um, these books were written to tell you what the right path is, and the one right path is, and all the other paths that were wrong. And usually they will cite a tradition. Do you know the tradition about 99 ways? Uh, attributed to a prophet, a tradition which the prophet is supposed to say that eventually in my nation there will be 99. Uh, oh, yeah. 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 And only one of them will be correct, all the rest will be in half. Yeah. Now, uh, it, it, never mind that that tradition, not again, not as a modern issue, but as it, if you look into the classical books of of hadith, you will find that this tradition is considered between weak or fabricated, outright, fa outright fabricated, but that doesn't seem to have affected its glorified status among puritanical uh, orientations. Uh, in fact, Albani has acknowledged, Albani is a very famous He's now deceased, uh, Hadith, puritanical Hadith scholar from Wahhabi orientation. And then he, in, a, in a rather uh, remarkable uh, um, uh, essay, he says that yes, I acknowledge that uh, nearly all the scholars of Hadith in the past have said that this Hadith is fabricated, but they're wrong. And they're wrong because he, he makes some arguments about Rijal, about the chain of transmission. But he says it is, it, it embodies the spirit of Islam. That, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, because, the, you know, this is certainly an argument. It embodies the spirit of Islam. That's why it's authentic. Well, so anyway, but I, I'm quite aside. But when, when, if you are, from a scholarly perspective, you, you go to these books of Al-Midal and Nahal and so on, and you look at them, and you don't actually sense a, 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 that these are texts of condemnation. And in what we're accustomed to in history is that what you do is you heresies is you suppress them, uh, persecute them, and burn their texts. You do not record them. You do not preserve them, right? And so, and these are not books of refutation. These are not books that were written to refute the various schools of thought. These were books that were written to document the existence of these various schools of thought. And that's very apparent to anyone who just, just reads these texts. This, of course, will raise in itself a very important epistemological question, and that is the place of diversity and difference of opinion is Islamic theology and law. But we'll get to that later. But we, we know as well that inquisitions, whether theological or jurisprudential inquisitions, were not a very successful historical, um, uh, uh, not very successful historical endeavor in Islamic history. 
We, we all know about the famous Mihna in which Ma'mun is supposed to adopt the Watazi school and he institutes this inquisition and the hero of the Mihna is supposed to be Ahmad ibn Hanbal, 